What is up guys, Taiki here and welcome to episode 12 of the Crypto Market Wizards podcast. Today I have here with me JMO. How are you doing today? Uh, not too bad. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So for the, the audience that doesn't know who you are, can you give us a brief intro of how you got into crypto and what you do now? Uh, yeah. So um, for quite some time, I was a professional poker player. Um, from when I graduated university, I want to say this is like I started playing professionally. I guess I started playing in like 2005, 2006, uh, somewhere around there. Um, but I started playing professionally full time, like 2008, 2009. Um, I got into crypto mainly due to necessity. So I got in pretty early um, using Bitcoin. Uh, just because uh, I specialized in online poker um, and there was legislation called UIGEA that passed in the United States around 2009, 2010, uh, which outlawed online gambling in the United States. Um, but, but for me, also outlawed um, the transactions between online gambling sites and my uh, domestic bank accounts. Uh, so I had to move abroad to play poker. Um, but I, I had always had the issue of moving funds back and forth. So then I discovered, uh, Bitcoin, I was pretty active in like the Bitcoin talk forums. Um, I, I played poker on one of the original Bitcoin poker sites. It was called seals with clubs, uh, shout out to Brian Mikon, who is like a legend in the Bitcoin community, but he was like one of the founders of that. Um, I, I gambled a bit in the in initial uh satoshi dice uh basically satoshi dice was a a gambling platform that was provably fair uh but basically you were able to confirm the the online casino being fair because the the bets were placed using a bitcoin transaction hash and the transaction hashes were random so um th this was when bitcoin was you know a fractions of a, what it is today Obviously, today, something like Satoshi Dice wouldn't really be pragmatic uh, just because it costs like multiple dollars, uh, if not like tens or hundreds of dollars, and, and sometimes of uh, heavy use to transact Bitcoin. But at the time, it was like fractions of a cent. So you, you could use Bitcoin blockchain um, for that. So, yeah, I got introduced uh, pretty early to, to Bitcoin. Um, I probably started trading. Uh, quite a bit um, within like a year or two of when BitMEX came out. So BitMEX was the first exchange that developed the idea of perpetual futures. Um, so like, uh, I want to say like 2000, like 14, to the end of 2013, um, I was still playing poker at the, at the time. I um, I learned a little bit about trading. And back then, I feel like the it was a lot easier to profit trading than it is today. Um, so I d did that sort of uh, part-time, I want to say around like 2015, 2016, maybe towards 2017, I slowly stopped playing poker and went into crypto full-time. Got it. Yeah. I know a lot of former professional poker players just make the switch to crypto. I mean, I was pro for a year in 2020 before I'm like, okay, like it's a bull market. I have to just pivots to crypto. Um, but has poker taught you anything? Um, like what are, what are some valuable lessons from poker uh, that you think is uh, really beneficial um, when you're trading crypto, identifying narratives, Ponzi's, you know, mitigating risk, all that? Uh, yeah, I would say that the biggest thing is risk management um, and dealing with variance. Uh, so the way poker works is it's a skill game, but there is a pretty large luck factor involved. Um, so the, the best players have like really good bankroll management. They, they set aside funds to, to do certain things, um, that they, they don't play outside their means. Also, they're able to be objective within their wins or losses. Um, like in poker, you could play every single hand correctly and still lose money, or you can, or, or, uh, or you can, uh, play every single hand incorrectly and win money. Um, but the ability to be objective of your play, um, to be able to review what you did and, uh, figure out if you're even, um, if you're winning a lot, if you're making a lot of mistakes to identify those mistakes and correct them. Uh, I feel like the same is 
um, with crypto in a way. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people that get into crypto trading, they are either like over leveraged or they're like more gambling. If, if they have positions that are like underwater and they're losing, they, they're they incentivized to gamble more. There's always like this sort of emer emotional factor um, with anything that involves money, but especially trading and stuff like poker and the ability to be rational, be level-headed, um, stuff like that is really important. Yeah, I, I noticed that, you know, whenever I play poker, you, you, I mean, you just have to believe in yourself, right? Because there's so much variance. You have to believe in your edge. You have to believe that, okay, like I'm plus EV at these games. You know, I'm, I'm on like a 10 buy-in downswing, right? You know, but I just have to believe in myself, keep playing, because if you don't play, then you'll never make money. Um, it, it's weird because... I would have like huge swings in crypto, but I'm not really bothered. But if I lose like one pot in poker, I, I just get super tilted nowadays. Um, I, I feel like crypto and po or poker like just kind of changes your relationship with money. Um, did, have you noticed that? Like, I'd rather like if I lose like thousands of dollars in, in a pot, I'm like, okay, like, you know, I, I, got, I got it in good, right? And then I go to Starbucks and it's like $8 for coffee. I'm like, fuck that yeah. shit. I'm out. You know? <laughs> I, I feel like that's one like really big advantage I have over most people is I'm like almost emotionally immune to like the swings in money. So I, I never get like super, super excited when I'm making a ton of money or if it's a bull market, and everything's going up. Um, I also don't get like depressed or angry or emotional when I'm losing money. Um, it, it's, I, I'd say that's from, just like over a decade of experience of gambling and having pretty big swings where like the, the there's going to be days where you lose a substantial portion of your net worth and there's going to be days where you're like absolutely crushing um but to but to experience those days repeatedly um i feel like is very important to a point where um my my mentality today is a, a lot different than it would be if i didn't experience those swings yeah. And, you know, you got into crypto pretty early and, you know, you were early to Bitcoin. Um, were you also early to ETH? Can you tell us about your ETH journey? Yeah, um, I purchased the, the ETH ICO. Um, I was pretty active on the Bitcoin talk forums that they had a sub forum. I believe it was called um, AMM. Uh, but basically, it, it was for new projects within the crypto space to to propose like what they're doing attempt to raise funding or sometimes most of the time actually it wasn't really to raise funding but just to you know bring the bitcoin community at the time uh exposure to what they were doing uh that so pr pr uh before the ethereum ico the whole idea of like any ico or any type of fundraising wasn't was almost non-existent um but yeah, uh, well, one of my friends linked me to the post there. I, I read through Vitalik's post. It, it seemed like a relatively uh, good idea. He seemed like fairly intelligent. Um, I I ended up like meeting quite a few of the um, the OGs in Ethereum, like around 2015, 2016. Um, there were like a few conferences, crypto conferences um, that they traveled to, and I I met with them. Our our views aligned in terms of what we thought the future of crypto would be um i mean it, i i i feel like it was a little bit bump, bumpy initially i don't know if you know the history of ethereum but um a huge portion of it was put in something called the dow um and it got exploited and then that's this is what the initial ethereum um is actually ethereum classic right now there was like a hard fork um that wavered my confidence in everything because like at the time I was very, um, I, I, I was very principled in the way where I thought like internet money, Bitcoin, stuff like that should, should be immutable. Like the, the, what happens on chain happens on chain. And then the whole fact that like, they're essentially, um, changing what happened to, to benefit them, even though they saw it was a necessity sort of, um, weigh in my belief in like the immu immutability of ethereum um but I, I mean that's that's ancient history like i feel like ethereum has taken like quite a bit of a new form since then this is like almost 10 years ago yeah i feel like that's something that people don't really talk about um and i know that some bitcoin maxis think that you know that dow hack 
is going to be the reason why it will never flip BTC. One thing I notice in, I guess, crypto is that if someone buys a coin and it makes them a lot of money, they just become maxis, right? Uh, they just become, it, there's this element of bag holder bias. Um, and the, yeah, 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 this tweet here that I want to share um, where, you know, bag bias is real and a serious limitation to most people in the space. Uh, so I, I guess we can talk about this both, but what do you think about, I guess, EPTC, like you know, the, the flipping? Um, and, you know, you made a bunch of money on ETH, but it seems like you're pretty, I guess, not that bullish ETH, right? Um, so how are you able to separate yourself from bag holding mentality or like bag bias? Yeah, I, I think bag bias is pretty real. Um, if, if you talk to people that got into Bitcoin pre-Ethereum, they're, they're pretty... Um, entrenched in their views on cryptocurrency like they, they they think bitcoin will be number one for forever um if you talk to people that get it got in on the, the last cycle they may think something like like solana or avax or sui or like all these new um layer ones are the future and not necessarily ethereum um and then there's obviously the middle ground of like the 2015 to like 2018 um uh, p people that have entered the market around that time, uh, believing in Ethereum. Um, for me, I, I think it's important to uh, remain objective as to the the limitations and the the outlook of all these coins. Um, I mean, like I, I was I was in crypto before Ethereum was even a thing. Um, I definitely saw limitations in Bitcoin, especially uh, the whole history of Bitcoin, like the infighting, um, the the, the the Segwit 2x big blockers versus small blockers, all, all that stuff. Um, I, I saw that as like a limitation to the the future of Bitcoin. Um, I, I was pretty bullish on Ethereum for a while. I, I feel like th that that tweet a little has been taken like a little bit out of context. Like I'm, I'm, I, I'm I don't think that e e Ethereum is going to tank, and then and like every other asset is going to go up against Ethereum. Um, it, it's just the, a lot of the narratives for the future of Ethereum as like this, uh, what Vitalik describes as a like global computer, basically just like a, a canvas where you can build whatever you, you want on it and anyone can use it. Um, that specifically has a lot of limitations. And then also the, the new layer ones that are popping up that in theory have better technology, can process transactions faster, have higher throughput, um, have uh, stuff like uh, parallel computing, uh, stuff like that, offer significant advantages to Ethereum. Um, I, I, even if you ask Ethereum uh, maxis that understand Ethereum, they'll admit that there are limitations right now in the current form of Ethereum. And until those are solved, um, at least in my opinion, until those are solved, uh, solved, um, Ethereum is going to have some issues going forward. And this is a thread that you're alluding to, right? Um, and I just like having, you know, people that give, I guess, controversial takes on my channel, just because I feel that a lot of people on Twitter or a lot of, I guess, influencers on Twitter and YouTube, they lean more towards the ETH Maxi camp. And I think it kind of distorts people's perception of, you know, reality and I guess like perception. Um, do, do you kind of want to like touch on, I guess, key points that you want to maybe expand on? Yeah. Uh, so like my, my thoughts there were basically, um, ever since like the, the, the few booms of Ethereum, like during the bull markets, um, starting with in 2017, uh, the whole ICO craze where people figured out that they can create ERC-20 tokens um, as a use case for Ethereum. And that drove like the market where people could fundraise, issue a token for a like protocol or platform that they're building. Um, at the time, it was a bull market. So like basically a majority of these tokens went up in some way and th that allowed for more and more people to, to enter the space. Um, but in the end, like, People, I, I feel like the, the market sort of realized that um, th this wasn't sustainable. Like you couldn't just be printing money out of thin air. Um, so then it died down. Like Ethereum went down, I want to say like 70, 80%. A, a lot of the tokens went down like 99% or, or more. Like if you look at the, the, the bigger ICOs in the years, like let's say 2017 to 2019, 
um, a vast majority of them, those projects like don't even exist today or their market cap is a small fraction of, of what it was then. And then well, we had a resurgence during um, like DeFi summer where there was automated market making, uh, uh, decentralized exchanges being built. Um, and then the whole idea of like LP providing uh, liquidity in order to yield farm. Um, the whole idea of decentralized finance was still uh, sort of born then. Um, but it, it, in my opinion, at least a lot of that was, wasn't r really sustainable either. Um, like the, the gains were huge, but the, the gains were not real yield on chain. Like people weren't trading or using the protocols enough to sustain an economy where like there's, there's stuff like Terra Luna, e even though it's, it's not really, um, part of Ethereum, but that sort of idea where like a, a set yield or like a certain threshold for yield for people to participate, um, wasn't going to last long term. So then like we hit another bear market and I feel like a lot of those protocols fell off quite a bit just because, um, it, I, it, it's not really like a whole narrative thing, but it's, it's just like if you look on chain, the activity on chain, uh, what, what people are doing on chain, it fell off quite a bit. The TVLs fell off quite a bit. And uh, at the point where people were making less and less money, um, they decided to put their funds elsewhere. Um, yes. So like at the time when Ethereum was like very popular and there was a lot of demand, the, uh, the, the way Ethereum works is the more people that use the chain, uh, the higher the fees are. And for a majority of the population, I feel like even in times of not so much on chain activity, there, the, the fees price, price out maybe like 90 to 95% of the population that want to use Ethereum, you only have like the, the big whales with like larger positions that can justify paying, say like uh, like a, a few dollars for like an approval and then like uh, 20 to 50 dollars for a smart contract interaction, stuff like that, especially if you're using a DEX or if you're using a protocol on chain. Um, it's very difficult to, to justify the, those type of fees um, unless you have like very, very large positions that you're moving or that the, the gains that you are making from those transactions will offset the, the fees you're paying on chain. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when I first entered, I guess, when I you know, went full-time crypto in 2020, I was just getting wrecked, right? I was like buying these farm tokens, I was being dumped on by these whales. Uh, and then when I, had to, when I wanted to capitulate on my position, uh, I had to unstake, this token, uh, at the sell it, uh, approve it. And then I lost like a couple hundred dollars and I was pissed. Uh, and then that's why I went to like an Alto one, uh, like Polygon, Avalanche, all that. Um, and in like, since the, I guess the cycle top in November of 2021, I thought Ethereum would, I guess, establish a bigger moat, um, or I guess, you know, establish like a lead relative to other L1s, but you know, Arbitrum ecosystem doesn't look that different. Optimism ecosystem looks the same. I mean, ZK Sync, the top, that, like, top project is Sync Swap, right? Um, it's like not that impressive. And then you go to a cheaper chain. It's like, oh, like, yeah, like Solana, Jupiter, it's cheap, it's fast, it works. Oh, you know, the, the tech seems to be improving elsewhere. I feel like the ETH Maxi community don't really empathize. Or they, have, they have trouble empathizing with like regular people because they just made a bunch of money on either. They think it's the best thing ever. They think it's going to, you know, be, I guess, the global settlement layer. Uh, but they don't really talk to, I guess, the average Joe that wants to turn $10,000 into $100,000 or something. Um, what, do, what do you think of, like, that type of... Like, is that kind of like the state of Ethereum right now? It's kind of stuck in this area where, you know, it's, it, it's good, but it's not that good. And then there's new chains that's doing... Like that's more higher performance user experiences better so so uh, i think like the ethereum community has sort of settled on the fact that um they if the ethereum base layer will be used as a settlement and security layer for like a, a robust ecosystem of layer twos um which wasn't the initial uh plan or a roadmap for ethereum it was just sort of out of necessity uh just because like it, it, they gained far more adoption than the the chain could handle, and their the technical advances didn't advance in a way that 
allowed more users to onboard and make it like a, a chain that, that everyone can use. So, so like their idea of uh, scaling is um, we're just going to use the base layer as settlement security and we're just going to have all these independent uh, layer twos launch and each will have their own ecosystem, each will have their own uh, user base. Um, I, I feel like the a big issue with this for Ethereum is... A, a lot of these L2s are currently Ethereum aligned, um, but the, the the value that they're bringing doesn't necessarily go back to Ethereum. The, 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 the only value that they are um, bringing back to Ethereum is they're, they're paying rent basically on the uh, Ethereum base layer. However, um, the development of these layer twos is independent from like what the Ethereum foundation, what the Ethereum developers are developing. And a, a lot of the technology can be transferred to other chains. So if you have like a roll up on Ethereum um, that gains huge adoption, has a native token, whatever, um, and the, there are tons and tons of people that use it, a lot of that value actually goes to the L2, like uh, is this some, something like Arbitrum. Arbitrum has like a pretty high market cap right now. The reason it has a high market cap is because like a lot of people use it. A, a, a lot of the, the value goes to their native token rather than Ethereum. And then on, on the flip side, if like, for example, something like StarkNet or Z, uh, ZK Sync, if they think that their technology is good, but they can move it to, say, an, another L1 and build a rollup on that L1, it's not like the Ethereum like foundation, the, uh, the Ethereum developers can really do anything because they're, they're separate entities, right? Like they're aligned right now. Um, but it doesn't mean necessarily mean in the future if like the technology improves in, in the L2s um, and uh, other L1s, whereas if the Ethereum uh, base layer technology doesn't improve, uh, the L2s are definitely incentivized to look at other L1s and possibly deploy there in, instead of uh, Ethereum. Yeah, and I think we've already seen, I guess, this trend where I think Lyra, which is trying to create some app chain, um, is like now using Celestia for data availability because it's, you know, like there's like more, uh, I guess like there's more utility, right? Like instead of like paying rent to Ethereum and paying all this money, you, you can go to Celestia and get 99%, I guess, reduction in fees. Um, what do you think the next cycle looks like? Because I have this working thesis that it's like the upcoming cycle will look pretty similar to last cycle where ETH, like Bitcoin does well, ETH does well. People tried using the chain as new users come online. And then the gas fees are insane. L2 ecosystem is, eh, it's okay. Um, and then people eventually just migrate to fast, cheap, you know, chains. Uh, do you agree with that statement or, yeah? Yeah, in, in a way. Um, so so I, I, I made that post that you referenced in, I want to say like, it was like October of last year. And um, like, not to pat myself on the back, but like if you look at ETH versus like a lot of the L1 assets, ETH underperformed like, like a vast majority of them, I, I feel since then. Um, I feel like recently, though, um, I, I've be, become like slightly more bullish on Ethereum going into the next cycle, just because uh, I, I feel like the the upcoming cycle, um, the, the one that like I feel like we're entering like now or pretty soon, a lot of it will be predicated on like the public inflows through um, the ETF. Um, I was actually pretty surprised as how quickly the ETF got up and running. Like, uh, I want to say on January 1st or 2nd, there was that matrix port report. Some interns said, like, the ETF will be denied. And then you saw, like, like an immediate 10% drop in the market. And then somehow, like, like a week later or, like, a few weeks later, everything is appro approved and they're all, all being traded. So um, I think one interesting thing, though, is there's been a lot of chatter about an Ethereum ETF to a point where I, I think it's pretty likely to happen within like maybe quarter three or quarter four of, of this year. Um, and that sort of changes the narrative for Ethereum because like the, the, the reason why people are bullish on Bitcoin through the ETF is because it's almost like a separate asset class versus like other cryptos because you can invest using traditional the mechanisms through traditional finance, you have like a a huge percentage of the population that can't or or won't or don't want to um, use the technology, but w w would like to invest in crypto. 
that are able to access Bitcoin at the time. And if, if Ethereum becomes like a similar asset, I, I feel like Ethereum might be competing more with Bitcoin in that space and they won't, wouldn't have to compete with stuff like Solana with like AVAX, stuff like that. Whereas now if Ethereum is only seen as like a, a smart contract platform um, where the decentralized applications that are built on it are the driving force um, behind the use and there are more and more layer ones that are producing better technology that, that are rapidly growing both in market share and in users. Um, th th that is far more difficult for Ethereum to compete with than like if it, the, the ETF happens and suddenly like I can log onto my, like my Vanguard or my, my IRA or my brokerage and invest in Ethereum and like, uh, I think like the interesting thing about that is e ethereum has like a staking mechanism it's like a completely proof of stake now so it's like a in people's eyes I, I think it'll be like a productive asset where if there are etfs that are you know staking their ethereum to secure the network and, and getting return not only does is the the bull cases the price will go up but their asset they'll accumulate more ethereum by investing in this way and i feel like it's getting like easier and easier um for your average person to get into ethereum staking um I, I know initially there are only a few players and you would have to figure out like your self-custody to interact with something with like lido or rocket pool but it, it, if that process becomes easier I, I feel like the 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 next cycle might be pretty bullish for ethereum um but that's a little bit far off right now yeah, I had Chow Wang on in the previous episode, and he would he gave his advice to the Ethereum marketing community or e Ethereum marketing department, where you know, like let's talk to the institutions, right? Like they don't care about ultrasound money. Like that just sounds like ridiculous. But if ETH can rebrand to uh, you know, the most institutional friendly, I guess, you know, smart contract platform with native yield. Like that's gonna just capture all the inflows, right? Especially if there is an ETF. Uh, do you think that's gonna like that narrative shift is gonna happen, um, or do you think it's uh, it's gonna be the same? I think it will eventually happen. Uh, I mean, like, I, I think it should happen because I, I I feel like the 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 market share that they can capture with that narrative is far greater than like the market share they can capture in like a overall smaller and more competitive market. And competing with um like all these l1s uh yeah like it, it should happen um I, I don't know if it will like i uh, hopefully it will because I, I think a lot of the value especially if like something like an e, e uh, eth etf uh bec it gets approved it sort of opens the floodgates for other l1s to possibly um uh, get approval for an etf get mainstream adoption stuff like that um so not only is it bullish for Ethereum, but I think it's just bullish for the space as a whole. Like the more people that, that the, the more people have access to these assets without having to go through the technical hurdles of buying them on chain. Yeah, I feel like the Bitcoin ETF is just a giga tailwind for the entire asset class because if the Bitcoin ETF happens, then the Ethereum ETF will eventually happen. And then if that happens, then eventually there's going to be a Solana ETF, like whatever, right? Um, and then it just it just gives people a reason to buy the dip, you know. Uh, it just improves sentiment so much. In your post on October, right, um, you mentioned that you're somewhat bearish DeFi, um, or I, I mean, I guess like last cycle's version of DeFi, where it was like not that sustainable. Um, do you think DeFi ever comes back, or do you think that it's kind of this played out narrative uh, that you know is going to do okay, but like not that great? Um. I think it's like almost, uh, I mean, it, it's not back the same that it was, you know, like in 2020, 2021, um, but it, it's back in a way. Um, I feel like there's a few narratives, the uh, the whole uh, being able to stake your Ethereum or your, your Solana for yield and then be, been, be given a, a, like a placeholder token um, and being able to, to use that for you know liquidity elsewhere um also the idea of bringing like yield bearing real world assets to chain i think is pretty big uh i, I don't exactly know how that's going to play out 
Um, I, I have my reservations. Um, uh, so far, it's okay, but it's it's pretty small in scale right now. Um, I, I feel like if it scales up to something like really big, like if there's like billions and billions of dollars of like, say, like U.S. treasuries on chain, then like the, the U.S. government might take notice and, you know, pre prevent this from happening. Because I, I know, like, historically speaking, they're they're very protective of um, their assets, especially like ones that dominated in U.S. dollar. Um, I actually watched. Uh, a documentary like a week ago um it was about the the one mdb scandal in malaysia um it, it basically that malaysia had like a sovereign fund and like a lot of the money got stolen and like the the u.s government intervened um and, and and their rationale was that because like the transactions happened in u.s dollars even though it didn't happen on u.s soil the the, the money never touched u.s banks outside of um, Goldman Sachs being a U.S. entity, basically any any transactions around the world that are denominated in U.S. dollars, especially large amounts of U.S. dollars, are under the the jurisdiction of the U.S. So, like, I feel like the the companies that are popping up right now that are bringing assets on chain that they may be um, domiciled somewhere outside the U.S. Um, and right now, the inflows are small. Their market caps are small. The amount of assets that they're that, that they're actually onboarding are are, are pretty small. Um, but it, if they scale up, I feel like th there might be some pushback that sort of stifles the whole DeFi RWA narrative on chain for uh, DeFi. Yeah, I I'm sure like my 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 viewers know that I'm on like a RWA bull, um, but that's partly because you know I've I've been in DeFi for over three years, you know, I've used all sorts of applications and I'm naturally a very optimistic individual and I'm like a believer in the tech and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I LP here, I LP there, I try out these types of mechanics. Um, but at the end of the day, like these products just are not good enough, right? These crypto native applications that take fees from people and then, you know, gives it out to you or inflationary farm tokens, it doesn't really scale that well. Uh, so I figured that the only way capital can remain sticky on chain, especially if rates, let's say, you know, remain above three and a half percent, is through tokenized treasuries. Uh, I'm I'm like pretty bearish other types of real world assets like real estate or like like watches or stuff. Uh, but I feel like short term treasuries, I, I guess like tokenizing them has has value. Um, but yeah, that's that's a pretty good point. Um, I'm it's still like a working thesis, but. I guess I have to reevaluate it uh, over time. Yeah, I, I feel like I have a slightly different view. Um, I'm I'm not that bullish on treasuries just because I feel like there's an upper upper limit for them to scale. Uh, I'm pretty bullish on new types of RWAs on chain. Like um, the, the big example that I like to see is something like corporate debt. If um, if you have like a big corporation, if you're looking to to raise funds or if you're looking to to borrow money, um, the it's the process is pretty difficult right now um but if you can issue it on chain and have like a debt token and that debt token um be you know on a dex or something so people can trade it back and forth so like for example if if a company wants a loan for well, let's say five years or, or 10 years it's difficult to find a counterparty that is willing to put it put in money and, and hold that position for that amount of time but if that specific asset, that that amount of debt is somehow liquid on chain, where there's like markets where people, people people can trade it back and forth, it becomes like quite a bit more appealing. Like I think rates will go down, uh, just because the, the the reason rates are high for loans like this is just like the loss of liquidity. You don't want to tie up capital for years and years. Um, but if the capital is somehow liquid on chain and it's you know transferred by something as simple as a dex swap. That, that opens like pretty big avenues for like a lot of companies to be able to to raise funds uh, using blockchain rather than like traditional financial methods. Yeah, new types of capital formation using the chain, I think, is really interesting. I, I know real world lending, like I guess like you know, that types of cor corporate debt get uh, a bad rap just because we've had some defaults for Goldfinch or Maple or like I guess all these. You know, eventually I think they'll figure it out, um, and it'll be cool if companies and like. I guess third third world countries can raise money from crypto degens by paying twenty percent or like whatever, right? 
uh, that, that could potentially be insightful. So I do want to pivot the conversation to more, more of the rapid fire questions and I guess, you know, tapping into your wisdom. So the first question, um, I mean, you know, you were obviously a big poker player. You got into crypto early and whatnot. Um, but a lot of my viewers, you know, they're just getting in or this is their second cycle. Uh, how do they make it, right? Like, how do they, like, do you have any advice for them to, if they want to, I guess, get to your level? Uh, uh, anything they can share? Um, I think the first thing I tell them is to take operational security very, very seriously. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people that have gotten in in the past cycle have done like quite a few risky things that have backfired. And like in retrospect, if they look back on it, like the whole risk reward um, it, it is, isn't there. Um, so I, I would say stick with like protocols or like L1s or assets that you're per fairly confident in um, and make sure you have like um, a secure setup, like a, a hardware wallet, stuff like that. Um, I, I just like look at the numbers of like the, the 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 amount of money stolen through like e exploits on um, even sometimes audited but like a sort of like n not popular um, uh, protocols and, and then also just the stuff like uh, phishing and you know like uh, all that stuff is fairly easily avoided um, so I I feel like just surviving just like staying in the game is like the most important thing and um, in order to do that, you need, you need to you know figure out operational security and take that uh, very seriously. Um, the, the other thing I, I'd say is it, it's it's sort of difficult um, just because a lot of the stuff that you can do in DeFi that's like relatively low risk that that's variance free uh, scales with the amount of initial capital you have. So for the people that have been through like multiple cycles that have made a, quite a bit of money. They're they're at a huge huge advantage going going into the next cycle just because they they have you know capital to deploy and and they have experience. So, so I'd say like if you're starting out and you don't have that much capital, uh, attempt to be as capital efficient as possible. Um, like I, I would sit down like once a week or something, look at what you're doing with your capital, look at the opportunities that you're considering, and figure uh, figure out if all, all your capital is deployed in a like reasonable and useful way and if it's not adjust your positions uh based on on that um and i, I guess the final thing is i i'd say maybe don't gamble too much in like these moonshot positions like uh, the, i mean the, the, there there are like very few cases where someone s starts with like a thousand dollars and runs it up to, to seven, uh, seven figures or something like w within a cycle. But I, I feel like those instances are blown up quite a bit um, publicly to a point where like if, if you're like a member of the community and then you see this stuff happening, you might think it's the norm, um, where it's, it's very, very unlikely. And a lot of it is more luck de dependent than, than skill dependent. So I'd say like, the overall expectation of what you're going to do if it's your first cycle, if you're new to crypto, did, did don't think that like if you start with like ten thousand dollars by like the end of the year, you're going to have a million dollars or something like that. That's just very unrealistic, and the expectation shouldn't look that way. Yeah, and I thought about this tweet that you shared, where you know, crypto Twitter. I mean, social media is basically just Instagram feeds. Right? Everyone's just sharing their wins, no one's sharing their losses. Uh, for every person that turns a thousand into a million, there's a thousand people that turned five thousand to zero, essentially. Uh, so there's some survivorship bias there. Um, just I guess have an identifiable edge that you have and push it. Is that kind of how you think about it? Instead of like just punting on moonshots. Yeah, like I, I would say, um, I'll allocate a, a small portion of your initial role on on moonshots um, and be prepared to lose like everything um, that you allocate to that. And the, the majority of your assets, I, I feel like you should just put in your, your highest conviction plays or your, your highest uh, return on average plays. Um, yeah. I, I don't think there, there, there's that much to it. I, I mean, if like, 
I, I recommend uh, people who who get in who have like decent starting capital to to keep a certain percent like always in in stable coins. So like f figure out wh what what percent you're comfortable uh, keeping in crypto, um, and then allocate a certain portion of that stable coins. If if your coins go up, um, then maintain that ratio. Um, just because like I feel like stable coins are pretty use useful and productive assets on chain. Um, you can get like a decent amount of almost risk free yield. Um, so if, if your assets are going up, take profit, ma maintain those ratios. If if your assets are going down, um and you have like a larger percentage of stable coins or may, maybe that's the time in order to to enter um the the assets you have positions in that are going down that are your higher conviction place um but, but other than that um it, just be diversified i i feel like uh, that that's another thing it, um is to diversify your your assets um the, the problem with diversifying or what people think uh, diversifying your assets in crypto is is like a lot of crypto assets are very very correlated so if, if you buy like if you're if you um, have like a hundred thousand dollars you want to invest in crypto and you're diversifying but you're just buying like ten alt ten thousand dollars worth of ten alt l1s that's not diversification that they're going to trade very similar to each other like on on a day-to-day -to, -day to month to month basis um so yeah, I, I think it's important to almost always hold like something like Bitcoin, almost always hold something like Ethereum, and hold uh, some some stable coins as like a majority of your portfolio. Um, try to use those assets as productively as possible, and then allocate a smaller portion to um, the, the lower cap stuff that may have higher upside, but also has a lot more downside. Got it. Yeah, that's. I think that's good advice. Um, what, what are some common traits of successful traders and investors that you've encountered? I mean, you, you've been in this space like essentially ten years, right? Uh, you've seen people blow up, make mistakes, still be around, make a bunch of money. Um, what are some, I guess, personality traits and qualities that they have that others don't? Um, I think uh, first and foremost is to remain objective. Um, in in all situations. Um, so to approach stuff analytically and not emotionally um i i think th this is more true in like bull markets where like all, all assets are going up and, and you may think like you missed like the, the the seventh meme coin on the solana that has been shilled this week you're 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 not paying enough attention uh you, you should be increasing your your size in these positions um I feel like with that that's a pretty bad mentality to have, um, like a FOMO, um, feeling bad about missing out on, on like these moonshot plays. Whereas, just have like a general thesis of like what you want to do in crypto, like the the sectors you want to invest in, the the, the stuff you want to do, and I, I I think like sort of um, drown out all, all the noise from other people. I mean, like even if other people are making like the high hundred X on their investments and you're only making like, you know, 10, 20% a year, like the 10, 20% a year is still pretty good. You know, it's still better than almost any other asset class, like outside of crypto that you would want to invest in. So, so, so don't be, uh, don't, don't compare what you're doing and the results of what you're doing versus what appears like other people are doing, uh, rather just like stay objective and go down your own path in, in terms of, like what you're investing in, what what you're doing in crypto, and like how you see the long term future playing out. Yeah, I think you said this as well. But I mean, if you're making any money at all, then you're doing better than most of the population. So just just keep believing in yourself, I suppose. What what are some biggest misconceptions about the crypto markets uh, that you see? Biggest misconceptions. Um, I, I I'd say. Well, I I, th I think I think the biggest one is that like a crypto is only used by criminals and it's it's just like money laundering and like shady shit that you know goes down. I I feel like that that describes like a small uh, percentage of what happens, but this, this stuff like that, you know, like the, the exploits, the the hacks, the the money laundering, um, all that. 
gets amplified publicly far more than like the, the majority of people that are just like holding or you know doing b basic things in crypto um yeah, yeah, I feel like crypto gets a little bit of a bad reputation um, because of that. Uh, a, a lot of that stuff like makes mainstream media news, whereas like it, uh, basically people just participating day to day in crypto and in minding their own business and not doing anything nefarious and stuff like that. They're just wanting, you know, like uh, sovereign control over over their assets, um, not to be tied to like a central entity or like a third party. Um, and, and just use blockchain as intended. I, I feel like that describes a large majority of the people in crypto. Um, but then, like you, and you, you pull up Twitter, and then you see like this person's going to jail for doing this, or like the, 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 there's this hack, or people are you know funneling illicit funds through t tornado cash and stuff like that. And you think that that's like the entirety of the market, where it's like a very very small subsection of the market. Yeah, and I guess that applies to your topic or, you know, your idea of like money laundering and stuff. But it also applies to, I guess, trading too, right? It's just like, just because you see something meant like make big headlines doesn't mean that that's the source of truth. So just remain objective um, and I guess find out the truth for yourself. Kind of going back to our previous conversation, um, you, know, you mentioned that buying 10 alt one, ones isn't really diversifying. Um, what do you actually think about, I guess, diversification versus concentration? Um, I'm a big believer in concentrating your bets. Um, of course, it has you know, it comes with like more variance and like more risk and whatnot. Um, but I guess like throughout your journey, um, what has been I guess the best trades? Uh, like what qualities does I guess your you know good trades have? Um, and do you prefer like I guess same like betting the same size every single time, or do you sometimes like betting big because you just have so much conviction? Um. So within crypto, I think that you can never really have like 100% conviction on something where you think that um, you, you, you put all, all your eggs in one basket uh, just because like a lot of the, the assets, whether it's like L1s or, you know, like uh, protocol tokens and so, uh, stuff like that are very similar to each other. Um, and the, 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 there isn't like, you know, the, 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 there isn't like a, a future that I feel like you can't have a future outlook where there's only one result and that that's like your highest conviction play being the, the correct play. I, I feel like a lot of people have um, varying levels of conviction um, in terms of like these assets. So like if we talk about L1s, um, like for example, I, I may think like right now, maybe Solana is is the best L1, but I I, I have. Um, I'm pretty bullish on the little, let's say, you know, like Avalanche or Polygon or, or something like that um, as, as a competitor. Um, I, I feel like you should diversify your positions and your ass, assets based on your your level of conviction. So like if, if I think that Solana is most likely to, to, to win this L1 war, I'm going to have like a larger position in Solana, but I'm still going to have positions in, in other L1s sort of as a hedge. Um, if you're if you're looking at it objectively and you think that uh, the, the, there are like a ton of players right now, but in the future um, it's going to be a situation where like the winners take most of the market share. So like let's say for example now there's probably like like forty or fifty L ones um, by the end of the year that will be competing for the same market share, whereas you know like two years from now maybe like five or ten of them will capture like ninety percent of the market share. Um, you sort of have to gauge your uh, conviction on, on, on each of them and consider like the other one, um, the, the other position you have as, as a hedge um, in terms of if like your highest conviction play isn't the market leader, then in, in that world or in that scenario, like your second or third or fourth conviction play um, is more likely to, to have larger market share uh, by this, at the end of this time period. Um, so yeah, like, uh, again, like it's not really diversifying if you're investing in like similar asset classes, but if they're all battling for the same market share and you think there only could be like a few winners within like a pool of many, um, it, it is diversifying in a way. And I, I feel like that the proper way to approach it is to, to allocate based on your level of conviction um, for, for all these assets. Got it. And I guess, you know, you've been here for 10 years, you've seen so many narratives and coins come and go. 
Uh, do you think that makes you more cynical um, about the markets, or do you still have this, I guess, belief in crypto? And you know, it's like these Ponzi's are here, and they they come and go. But you know, it's I'm, I'm super bullish this space. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm cynical about like some things, and I'm I'm relatively bullish or optimistic about everything else. Um. Yeah, like the I feel like the, the, there's a lot that goes on that's just uh, super nonsense, and it, it's um it, it's stuff that's like obvious to me that's like a fad and that's gonna die down and people are gonna definitely get wrecked by buying buying tops of whatever they're doing, um and it, it becomes more of like a marketing you know like narrative driven community based like pump rather than like actual progress in crypto um but but on the other hand i, I feel like there's quite a bit of innovation that has happened and that will happen um to a point where i, I think like uh, unless something drastic happens uh, there's there's nothing that in my eyes the, the, there's nothing that really will make me overall bearish and like the entire outlook of the crypto market got it you know like that that makes sense and is it that you know do you think of trading as a ways to stack your bitcoin and ether holdings um do you have any like i guess trades that you're proud of it can be you know this year last year or you know maybe even five years ago i i guess like massively shorting luna was like one of my biggest positions um i to me that was like super super obvious that 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 whole nonsensical thing would fail um i i i actually like i'm 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 generally still surprised of like how the whole luna situation went down where you have like these mostly intelligent people like working at funds that had like massive positions in luna and if you look at like the economic model um you, like the economic model was tied directly to you know the the security of the chain the whole the, the way that that luna and ust worked right and the, like the, the, that should have been red flag number one that's like it, it's never good that like the security of your chain your your l1 fails if your token goes down too low that 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 that, that shouldn't be like part of the the, the design of um of anything and it 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 just seemed to, to me that like it was one of those projects that like obviously would do well in a bull market um but if people were like really objective and like thinking logically about like what exactly they were doing um they would know that it would have to end at some point i mean like maybe not if like we were like in a perpetual bull market where it was just like up only for like the next 10 years um then maybe it would, it would sustain. But um, other than that, to me, it, it was something that was like obvious that was going to fail. And to, to, to me at the time, like uh, uh, there, there was like a period of maybe six months where like I, I tweeted about how Luna was going to fail like w w once a week. But yeah, I, I'd say that I'm, I'm most proud of. Like I, that was like easily like my largest short position ever. I just like kept adding and adding to it. it, it the whole thing didn't make sense to me the the cult of personality of Do Kwan and like the people like following him like the lunatics uh, stuff like that um, I, I felt like at some point something had to give and I was like very very correct in the outcome yeah and, and I think like Luna and also FTX right it's like it's kind of this herd mentality of well if if that guy likes it then you know I also like it and then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and it, even I got caught in like the whole Luna uh, antics and as soon as it depegged, I knew it was over. You know, um, I didn't consider shorting it. I just like sold everything, but it was very stressful times. Okay, uh, I guess the final question I have for you, and thanks for thanks for taking the time. But um, if you can go back in time, it can be ten years or five years. Um, what kind of advice would you give your younger self? Um, well, are you are you talking about like within crypto or just like in general life advice? Just life, just life. I, I guess a, a few things. I, I would say, like, uh, first is to to to, to me be more patient about things. Like to to not it, it, like I think this pertains like uh, to to crypto quite a bit um, because the, the, even before like Ethereum came out, that there was a time when like 
uh bitcoin had its first run up it went from like it, it dumped to maybe uh i want to say like under a hundred dollars 115 and went up to like i want to say like 1400 um and then like we, we saw like a pretty prolonged uh bear market where it went back down to i want to say like three four hundred dollars and, and and it seemed like um, it, 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 dur during that time, like I, I lost like some conviction in Bitcoin just because like nothing was happening. Um, it, it, it felt like um, the, the, there wasn't like real innovation. Whereas, um, like in, in retrospect, like we, we were definitely just early, and, and I feel like it, it's sort of what's happening now um, in crypto. Like the whole the the whole ICO boom, the whole DeFi summer. Um, the the protocols that were developed were pretty rushed, right? Like you have you have founders, you know, like spinning up a, a project and then launching within a period of like three to six months, whereas like real development takes quite some time. So I, I feel like the whole advance in technology and um, the the future of crypto isn't necessarily going to be tied to just the market cycles. Um, if 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 coins go up. It doesn't make the the technology like better in any way. It, it, it doesn't make like the the rate of technol te technological growth go faster. And I feel like most people don't realize this. I mean, like maybe you get more funding, maybe you have more people in the space, but in general, like a, a lot of these things like uh, take a while to build out. Um, I, I think a good example of this um, in the future is th th there was like a a, a pretty big push or a pretty big narrative going around like the previous cycle of blockchain gaming like we would have games and like we'd have nfts and in game assets uh that are going to move back and forth on chain and in theory it's like a great idea the, the the problem is is like in order to develop all this infrastructure in order to develop these games like if you look at like the the triple a games that, that are sold on like steam or retail that they take like years and years of like the best developers that have been developing you know, within this industry for like decades uh, to, to develop, and a, a lot of the the products that were that were rushed out at the time were basically like rushed out within a matter of like months, just because like we were in like this market cycle at the time, and we needed a product. And I feel like that's not a good representation of the potential technology. So, um, yeah, I'd say like if you have conviction in things, if you have like a a, a view f for the future to just stay patient and realize like it, it takes time for stuff to develop and, and don't get discouraged if you know like time passes and it seems like there isn't progress being made yeah i know i think i think that's great yeah i think a lot of people in crypto they just want things now right it's like you know and then if some coin goes up 10 percent, there's like this meme where well the technology improved 10 percent today you know like it's so bullish yeah but in reality it's just like you know i mean the market's so Markets are so illiquid that, you know, it's just like three dudes buying a bunch and it's like of 10%. And everyone's like, everyone's up money. It's like, oh my God, like I'm so rich. But then, you know, those three dudes sell and it's like down 20%. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I feel like that goes back a little to what we talked about earlier about being, uh, having emotional control. And like the, like for me, the benefit of playing poker was you, you, you never, like I, I never get like super excited if my coins are up like 20% in a day. But then I, I never get super depressed if they're they're down twenty percent in a day, like um and and I think that just like comes with experience. Like I I don't know if like giving my younger self this advice would really help, but it just like comes with the experience. If you're if if you're like in the in the space in the industry for quite some time, and then you just like deal with this on a on a fairly regular basis, um then like your mind, your emotions and stuff like that sort of get hardened and get, get used to the swings to a point where like uh, eventually you'll be able to like always be logical, always be rational and not consider like, and then and not be, you know, like on emotional high one day and then an emotional low the next day, just based on like what your bags or what your coins are trading at. Yeah. And the only way to get there is by just being in the space every day putting capital on the line, you know, feel the pain, feel the euphoria. And only after you've experienced that like 30 times, can you actually be like, you know what, like, I'm comfortable, you know, just my net, my net worth is going up and, up and down 10% every single day. Um, 
Yeah. But anyways, th- thanks, JMO, for uh, this great conversation. Do you have any final words for anyone? Final words of advice to all the DGENs, uh, all the you know people trying to make it in this space? Um, final words for all the DGENs. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I'd say try not to be too degenerate. Like be uh be a little less degenerate. You don't need to. You you don't need to make it all in one trade. It, like you you can make it over the course of like like a year or two years or five years. But I I feel like uh, crypto will be around for quite some time, and um survival is key. That that uh, like from past experience. I know people that were like completely blown out in the last cycle or like previous cycle that are just like completely sidelined for the the remaining uh, cycles yet to come. So just being able to survive like the bear markets um, to, you know, to maintain rather than, you know, try to like 100x or 1000x your your positions, I I think is like really important to, to have that mentality so you can just like remain in the game. And if opportunity arises, like you're you're still there and you have the ability to capitalize on those opportunities yeah and i guess if you just like make it all in one trade then that could be luck right but if you make it yeah but if you compound like 10 trades in a row it's like oh like it could still be luck but it's Mm -hmm. very unlikely that it's luck you know yeah it's It's like similar to like a poker analogy right If, if you like if you play one session of poker and you win like it's it's far more likely luck than anything else but if you play like hundred thousands of hands and then you win like uh, eventually the the luck regresses to the mean and then you you see your true true win rate rate or your 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 true return within like certain markets or like certain games or whatever you want to call it yeah i feel like it's a little bit harder in crypto too because at least when you play online poker there's like the ev line right where you know i'm expected to win this many big blinds but in reality i won this many big blinds so i'm like okay like i you know but in crypto you, you don't know that yeah, I, and then not to get into too much of a poker discussion, but like I don't even think the EV line is very indicative. Like for example, if you if you have like pocket kings and you just like run into pocket aces repeatedly, you, you, your EV is pretty bad there. Um, but in in reality, like it, it doesn't account for the like the average result of of doing what you're doing. So like yeah, it, it, it's difficult to to judge. There's going to be like pretty huge standard deviation even if you have an edge in and what you're doing um so the, the the only thing you can do is just like continue doing what you're doing if you think it's going well if you don't think it's going well review what you're doing make changes and uh go from there yeah well anyways yeah thanks jmo for uh this great con- great conversation uh where can people find you I guess on Twitter I'm cunty cakes one two three um I I do an occasional uh podcast with um my buddies at uh shitcoin.com um I, i'd say half of them are me blake and andreas and we just go over crypto news and our thoughts on crypto news um uh, uh, andreas is a pretty high level developer he um he, he's been in uh crypto as, as long as i have um so he, he's he's seen almost anything um and then like occasionally it's like just me and i have uh certain guests on um a, a lot of the guests are i'd say like pretty well known in crypto or at least doing interesting things in crypto um and then like i i feel like i'm pretty well networked where i like I, I know a lot of people in crypto that are doing really cool things so I, I just use it as a platform to to allow them to talk about what they're working on or their views um i'll, I'll try to i'll try to get some more um I, i'm pretty lazy um and i I, don't, I only do it like maybe like once or twice a month uh, but I'll try to get more. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try to get more episodes out there. Yeah, no, I, I listen to Wage Cucking a lot. And sure. Like, what, what are these names? Like Wage Cucking, like your Cunty Cakes one. Like, what, what's the origin behind Cunty Cakes? Uh, so I used to play a lot of Dota, and um, my screen name on uh, Dota was Carry Cakes. So, like, for those who don't know, like a carry in um, these games is like. A, you're like the hero that basically does everything. Um, and then when I played, uh, when I played poker, my screen name was also, was also carry cakes, um, on like poker stars. So it was based off of that. Um, the, the, the whole, the whole wage cucking thing was an inside joke between, uh, me, Andreas, and I guess a little, little bit, Brian Mycon for, for, for those who don't know Mycon, he's like one of the, the funniest, uh, coolest Bitcoin OGs. 
But um, if you just go to YouTube and Google Cuck Tower and watch that video, um, it, it basically he he, he uh, uh, it's hard to explain, but you should you'll watch that video. But the, but the idea of, of wage cucking is uh, I, uh, I always joke around with them because I'm by all intents and purposes like very unemployed. Like I just I just do what I want, and they have like real responsibilities and real jobs they like run companies and stuff like that so we used to always like it's just like an inside joke where where like i, I asked if they want to you know go out and have dinner and they're like no we can't i'm, I'm wage cooking i i have work you know just stuff like that so um well when, when i agreed to do the podcast with uh with andreas um we uh we agreed to to name it wage cucking because it's like the only real responsibility I have during the day. Oh, I, oh, I see. I see. No, yeah, that's a good story. Well, anyways, yeah, everyone, everyone make sure to check out JMO, uh, Cunty Cakes on Twitter, wage cucking on YouTube. Uh, pretty good content. Well, hope you guys enjoyed episode 12 and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.